<coughs> oh, come on. Come on. All right. If, if you want to complain about this, then I'm going to remind you that you voted for it, so suck it up. I know. The, the automatic response is, well, Mr. Beavers, it's just like voting between a Republican and a Democrat. There's two bad options. Okay, fine. Like, what <laughs> He that, you know? FDR's background, born into a very wealthy family. When I say wealthy, I mean very wealthy family. He was on, there were two branches of it. There was a Long Island branch of the Roosevelt clan, which is where Teddy Roosevelt came from, and he was from the Hyde Park clan of the Roosevelts, and that is in upstate New York. Uh, if you've never been to upstate New York, it's some of the most beautiful places in the country. I mean, it is really nice on the Hudson River. You, know, you can see why rich people would want to live there, right? Um, they made a lot of their money through real estate and other business ventures, including the opium trade. Oh, no. Okay. Now, some of you don't know what opium is. Some of you do. That's fine. Um, I took some pictures of the people and put them to our FCA. Good luck. Somebody said, I'm going to leave your hand. And I didn't see any pictures. We were still feeding. That was my rule. 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 I will admit. I will admit that I did. I was on my phone because I. <coughs> no, 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 that's okay. I just the FCA to... chat group, right? So you were texting during the play? Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. That's, that's, that's not a lot of pictures. That's, that's fine if it was just pictures. You can get fired. Yes, it was just pictures. Viewers. <laughs> 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 I didn't think it <laughs> Since we're on silly things right now, oh, that's, that's a dude. That's a dude. This is FDR when he was a baby. Oh. In the late 1800s, it didn't matter what sex the baby was. Rich people dressed their babies up in like dresses. They dressed them up in dresses. So. You ever see that? There you go. It just kind of shows you that gender norms aren't really what, they're not like set in stone, right? They're, they, they're, they're just kind of, they're fluid. It just kind of goes back and, and forth, so, so whatever. Right? So uh, there you go. Now, he went to elite private schools. One of his elite private schools in high school was called Groton. Then, of course, Harvard and Columbia. He married a Roosevelt, that was of the distant, like, sixth cousin Long Island clan. Eleanor Roosevelt was Teddy Roosevelt's, like, first cousin. And so a lot of people think, and historians think, that FDR was marrying someone who would help him politically because she was cousin to the, at that time, president, Teddy Roosevelt. Um, I'm not sure. I think that there was a little bit of romance in their marriage, but he cheated on her more than JFK cheated on Jackie, so yeah. I'm not sure how long the romance actually lasted. It was a, a marriage of political convenience for him. <laughs> but they were a power couple. By the time he becomes president, she is well known in her own right, and she lives decades after he does, and presidents go to her after he dies, and basically says, hey, do you approve of what I'm doing? It was kind of like a rite of passage. She had to get her approval. She was just, she was a superhuman being. And I'm not saying he wasn't a superhuman being, but in my culture where I grow up, cheating on your wife like that is like considered like a really bad mark on your character. Um, and so I, you know, but, but she was awesome. Yeah, she was tall. Mm -hmm. He served in New York State Senate for a few years, and then he became assistant secretary to the Navy, just like his cousin, distant cousin, Theodore Roosevelt, had done. 
And then, just like his cousin Theodore, he ran for vice president. Unlike his cousin Theodore, he lost that election. Um, they lost that election to Republicans um, Harding and Coolidge. And that was the 1920 election. We didn't go over that one, but you can see there, it was relatively close, but not, I mean, you know, Harding won pretty easily, but you can see it was definitely better than, than Hoover fared against FDR. And California being Republican, too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. At age 39, which is rare because this disease attacked little kids, he got polio. This is a little kid's disease. This is something that like you got when you were a little kid, and if you got to adult age, you thought that I'm past it. Um, and if you don't know what polio does, it like attacks your immune system. My grandpa had it. My grandpa, I never saw him able to walk on his own. Like he always had crutches or a wheelchair. Um, and this is why like FDR almost died. Like he was that close to dying. He was in and he was going up the political ladder and then he has to drop out. And this is during a time when handicapped people, um, there's no future for you in politics, right? There's probably not a big future for you just about anywhere during those days, right? But definitely not then. Um, and he was unable to walk unaided for the rest of his life. And you might have asked yourself, Mr. Beavers, I saw pictures of him yesterday. He was making speeches and stuff. And what literally had to happen was he had to have one person or two people next to him. He had his braces locked underneath his pants, like his, his braces were locked, and he would kind of have to shuffle, right? A lot of the pictures of him are from a car where you can't really tell that he's got his braces on. He's smiling and waving. Or he's been behind a podium waiting for hours, maybe, while the crowd fills in to hear him speak. Like, it's, it's just, it, it, it's one of those things. they got to get him out quick. They get a couple people next to him. He's our first, I think, only handicapped president that we've had. That's what he looked like. Young, dapper politician before he contracted polio. Uh, later in his life, you know, he was wheelchair bound um, all throughout his presidency, obviously. He makes a comeback seven years after contracting polio and becomes, as Al Smith is leaving the governor's office in New York, he's becoming the governor of New York. And then he does some things as governor of New York during the Great Depression, the early parts of the Great Depression that makes him seem like a very like on the spot, like I'm going to be active before things get bad, kind of, you know, that's what proactive means, progressive kind of governor. Like, for example, the New York Emergency Relief Administration in New York helped give homeless and unemployed people money in the state government. And yes, he's going to pattern some of his programs after what he did in the state of New York when he gets to the president's office. Okay, so um, just remember that the election of 1928 with Smith versus Hoover, and Hoover wins that percentage of the popular vote, which is a pretty big margin in electoral terms. And the electoral votes for Hoover were 444, which is, a, that's landslide material. I think. Look at what Hoover, Hoover gets when he runs against FDR, for President 32. This is Hoover, right? Hoover's percentage of the popular vote goes down almost 20 points, which is embarrassing. And Hoover's electoral vote in 32 goes down to 59. Remember the quote from yesterday, even dogs took an instinctive dislike to Hoover? That was the quote from the time. Wow, that's a big difference. It's like, reversal of fortune, right? During the campaign, FDR was kind of quiet about what his actual plans were. He never actually came out and said, here's what I'm going to do X, Y, and Z. The New Deal is going to be this, this, and that. He never, never says that. He wants to be quiet about it. He doesn't want to give Cal's or uh, Herbert Hoover like any ideas. Or um, but he does present himself as, if Uncle Sam, our country, is a sick person, then he is going to be Dr. New Deal, and he's going to give the remedies to the, the country that it, that it needs to have. So, now some clues, he, he did make this really, like, you don't have to ever read this speech unless you take my college credit plus class. 
very few people in our country have ever read this, but he actually does give us clues as to what he's going to do. He, he, he tells us something about his plan in the Commonwealth Club Address. This is a, a California group of people. They're you know, intellectuals, and they, they invite you know, famous people to, to talk and, and so on. Um, and he said in this Commonwealth Club Address, essentially this. I'm, I'm, I'm dumbing it down for you. Not dumbing it. I'm, I'm summarizing it for you. Right? The Constitution was written in the late 1700s, and it was okay for the late 1700s. It was okay for that time. This is what he said. I'm not saying this. This is what he said. You don't have to believe this or even think this is awesome. I'm just telling you this is what he said. But industrialization happened after that. And the Constitution wasn't written for an industrial age. In other words, the Constitution doesn't hasn't kept up with the time. Because if the Founding Fathers knew that there would be the Rockefellers and the Carnegie's and the J.P. Morgan. And so on. They might not have said some of the things that they said. Right? Our old constitution is no longer enough to protect us from economic uncertainty or the power of rich tycoons, robber barons. So, obviously, something needs to change, right? What we need is an economic bill of rights, a new bill of rights, a bill of rights that matches our time period. You can keep the old bill of rights, that's fine, there's nothing wrong with freedom of speech, freedom of religion, no, no, no unreasonable search and seizure, trial by jury, all that stuff, those are fine, but we need to add to it because there's been changes. New rights to help us live in a new industrial world, um, and really what this means is that your rights aren't absolute, they change with the time. Now, I'm going to give you my opinion on this one. And you can take it or leave it. But that scares me a little bit. Because if times change to a certain point, then what if the next period of U.S. history means your freedom of speech shouldn't be protected? There's so much misinformation out there, right? We shouldn't protect lies that fool people, right? Just freedom of speech. What about religion? Is freedom of religion absolute, like it should always be protected? What if times change? So I'm a little bit scared about that, but what he's saying is that there's new things we need to add. And also, by the way, our government needs to be run by people who are not politically bound. They're not Republicans or Democrats. All they care about is the good of the country, not getting elected. We call that the age of enlightened administration, where we basically get power to these few people to make the decisions for all of us. We'll have people manage our economy from the top down. Because they're smart, they've been trained to go that way. I don't know what you think about that. You can you can leave, take that or leave that. If you don't understand it, then that's fine too. Let's just go on to things that we definitely all can understand. Do you have any questions though before I proceed? Okay. So, in the campaign of '32, uh, Hoover was at least as boring as me. I mean. Because everybody agrees. Okay. He did not inspire confidence, uh, but obviously I talked about yesterday, FDR did, right? Now, FDR wins, right? FDR wins. And um, the tradition is that when the outgoing president is leaving and the incoming president is going to be inaugurated, that they meet at the White House, they get in a car together, they ride to the inauguration site, and, you know, the whole time they're chatting and having a good time and blah, blah, blah. Even if they were political rivals, they do that. Barack Obama did that with Donald Trump. I think Donald Trump not getting in the car with Joe Biden when he came in is the tradition. Imagine that, Donald Trump breaking tradition, right? In this case, Hoover does ride with him to the inauguration, but it's a very frosty car ride because basically all throughout after the election, Hoover kept calling FDR and said, hey, I got this idea of what we can do. You know, why don't you buy into it and then it'll get done and FDR is like, Everything you touch turns to ash. <laughs> I mean, do they look like they're buddy buddy? Does this Hoover look like? On some head goggles. <laughs> it's actually called a Nez Pence. They look like some head goggles. 
Those are sunglasses that have no rims. I mean, he looks like he's got a hemorrhoids or something. <laughs> and this is how the press depicted it. FDR is so you know smiling and charming, like as always, and but there's a Hoover. Actually, Hoover does for the rest of his political career go around and make speeches saying how bad the New Deal is. And he actually becomes a better speaker. Kind of like, well, if you had had that back then, maybe it would be less. Okay, so in his first inaugural address, he says, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. He says, also, this is at the beginning, this is at the end. We're going to wage war on the Great Depression. We're going to battle against the Great Depression. And you know what? That sounds awesome, doesn't it? Somebody's going to do something finally, but I want to, I want to pause just real quick. How much power does the president get during war? A lot. A lot of power. More power than they usually would. Should a president get more power like that if we're not actually being invaded by a foreign enemy? Well, that's what he says in his first inaugural address. I hope that the normal way of doing things is okay, but you always have to look for those big butts. Like Sir Mix a lot. Baby got back. You gotta look for those big butts in speeches because he says, but in case it doesn't work, I want more power. Now let's see if you think that he used this power well. Get get to it. What in the world did he actually do? What was this new deal? Okay, here you go. In his first 100 days in office, thing after thing after thing gets passed. And ever since then, every single president, we look back and we say, hey, during those first 100 days, did you do as much as FDR? And the answer is always going to be no, but you're always compared to how effective FDR was. So the first thing he does, um, of course, he gets a ton of laws passed. Congress just like rubber stamps, like the, the COVID, right? Um, and the New Deal was born. There's a lot of ways to, to break this down. There's a first new deal and a second new deal. There's a relief recovery reform. There's economic parts of the new deal. There is social parts of the new deal. There's political reform parts. I mean, you could break it down in a lot of different ways, but essentially, I'm just going to try to lay out for you a whole bunch of alphabet soup now. And your job is going to be to remember what's the difference between the CCC and the AAA and the TVA and the NRA and the SEC and the WPA and the PWA and the CWA. That's going to be your job. Ready for it? It does. And, yeah, right? We've got to address banking. We've got to address farming. We've got to address employment. We've got to address businesses going out of business. And we've got to address housing and the stock market. And if we address those things, then boom, magic. It's all over, right? The Great Depression is gone. Not too complicated, huh? Piece of cake. And these are the things he addressed in his first new deal, in his first three years in office. Especially during his first few days. Is that good, everybody good? Does anybody need me to stop, pause for just a little bit? Just for a second. Just for what was your how were we? What was your official title? Your your character's name? Oh, you're princesses. Were you also in the Daughters of Triton? No. I, yeah, okay. <laughs> you did well, by the way. Okay, banking. First thing he does is bank holiday. We learned that yesterday. The day he takes office, March 5th, 1933, he shuts the banks in the country, orders them all to be closed. He rushes, I think they said yesterday, $2 billion dollars which back then was like, I, I know that today, like we sneeze $2 billion out of our left nostril whenever Congress passes a law, right? But back then, that was a big deal. That, that was a ton of money. When the banks reopened, you heard it yesterday, deposits exceeded withdrawals, it seemed to work. The first thing he does works in like three days. 
okay, good, right? The, the banking system seems to be a little bit more stable now. And in order to improve upon this, there's a, we get the Glass-Steagall Act, which is, improves on banking reform. And it creates something that we all have today. It still exists today. These New Deal programs, a lot of them, like they did in this last couple of years, like this thing still is around. FDIC, here's some alphabet soup, your first bit of alphabet soup. FDIC, Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation. Now, do you want to guess what that means? Does anybody actually know what the FDIC does? Like, you know enough about banking because maybe you have your own checking account or whatever, but you know what the FDIC does? Because it's all like every bank's window that they're a member of the FDIC. Okay, deposit. Yeah? Protects your money. The money that you put into the bank is insured by a federal corporation. We do that. Buy tickets, you can buy an insurance for Right, it's the same kind of kind of thing, right? Now the federal government doesn't do that for ticket master, but right. you get the idea. If you had five thousand dollars in the bank back then, do I have that here? If you had five thousand dollars in the bank back then, and then that bank closed its doors, it shut down forever, before you would lose all that five thousand dollars. Now the federal government will pay you back, will give you your money back. Today, up to $250,000. If you had it in the bank and the bank shuts its doors, the federal government will make sure you get that money back. It was $150,000, but then Barack Obama had to go up for so, That is a lasting reform that FDR got. It's still with us today for protects bank deposits. And you might see this, now that you know about it, you might see this in more places if you just, if you just look, that's all. Okay, farming. Second bit of alphabet soup. The AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration. Essentially, what they wanted to do was raise prices by lowering supply. Now, remember how Hoover wanted the federal government to buy crops and take them off the market. What we're doing here in the New Deal is we're paying farmers not to plow at all, not to plant at all. So if you have 100 acres, then they're going to ask you to not plant on 30 of them. What? You're telling the farmer not to grow more crops? It doesn't make any sense. How are you supposed to make any money? Well, what's the, the economic argument here? If there are less crops being grown, then there will be higher demand and the prices go up. Right? That was the idea. That was the gist. And actually, this law actually said, right now, you don't plant that next year, but right now, you're going to have to plow under millions of acres of, of, of corn and wheat. You're going to have to slaughter millions of pigs and like not use their meat, just like bury them or something. Right? You can imagine the criticism that, 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 that this got from some people uh, because... People were hungry, right? But notice, over the next couple of years, the price of bushels of wheat went up about 10 cents. Now, if you know much about farming, that's not a ton of money, but it did go up where it didn't go up under Hoover. Oh, that, we're just getting started. That's not even close to being all. Employment, we have the CCC. More alphabet soon. Yay. Civilian Conservation Corps. If you were a young man out of high school, or if you dropped out, you could get hired by the CCC to go out and do manual labor, especially out west where there are nat national parks, keep you from getting into trouble. Because mm -hmm. we all know that that's what idle young men do. Idle hands are the devil's playground, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You would get $5 a month for working. Your family would get $25 a month. Win-win. Now, they were made to wear uniforms. 
They had to live in a barracks. It was almost like being in the military. And so some people criticize me for that. But, you know, you can imagine sometimes, ladies, am I wrong? Sometimes young men just need a little bit of this. Some critics said it was too much like the military, but you can see there were propaganda posters all around saying, hey, go join the CCC. Right? Okay. The roads parts. Soil erosion project. Why would we need that? Dust. Bowl. Flood control projects. Planted trees. That's another thing to prevent dust bowl from happening. I mean, hundreds of thousands of young men working on this, being paid by the federal government to work not get in trouble. I mean, it was, it lasted until World War II. And then there were so many jobs available for the young people. Yeah, but there's going to be, look, let's just address this right now. Commercial break, right? How many of you are expecting to get it at least a charge a little more? I didn't even know anyone thought we had a shot at that. Teachers have been talking about it. You There's also said that we weren't getting out those two ways guys too. To be fair, yeah. there's oh. psychology. Mm -hmm. That's what I thought you were doing because what I thought you didn't know exactly. It's supposed to be raining all day, flooding everywhere, like yay. Yeah. And that's then the temperature's supposed to drop. It's supposed to be really yeah. Look, the best case scenario for tomorrow I promise. The best case scenario for tomorrow is supposed to have a two hour delay coming in. Because if we have a two hour delay and then it's canceled. Then we have to all be on remote learning and we have to like see each other. Oh, how, how, do how do they do that? How do they do that? Well, you run a two hour delay schedule. Yeah, it's like an hour before. And then you start to make the teachers come in each one. Yep. Yeah. 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 PWA, Public Works, Public Works Administration, gives money to the states to help create jobs. So the states would be in charge of this, but as money coming from the federal government, PWA built schools and other community buildings. I mean, this is just another thing to help give people jobs. Oops. It'll get real interesting when you have the WPA later, which does the same thing. Ooh, good luck remembering the difference between those two. <laughs> CWA, when the PWA wasn't enough, we're going to add more jobs. It's called the Civil Works Administration, not Public Works Administration. What's the difference, Mr. Beaver? Not anything, really. Right? Four million jobs, like right now, we got a four million job. Ow. Critics called the work boondoggle, right? We want to get people working. We don't really have enough work for them to do, so what are we going to do? Boondoggling means they're going to pay you to dig a hole and then fill it back in again. Like working at Walmart. Right? Okay. <clears throat> Era, Federal Emergency Relief Administration. More alphabet soup. This is the first welfare program what we would call as welfare today, meaning that there was money given by the federal government to the states and then a check written directly from the, the state government given to you and you didn't have to do a job or permit. This was patterned after what FDR had done in, in New York and basically given to the states so they could give the aid directly themselves. The TBA, the Tennessee Valley Authority, in the Tennessee River Valley, which stretched for many states in the South, the federal government's going to hire people to build dams and hydroelectric power plants so that they could be flood control and so that a very poor part of the country in the Appalachian Mountains could get electricity. This was a way to help change an entire region that was one of the most poor and impoverished regions in the country. It's still trying to lose a little bit today. 
I don't know if any of you have ever been to Southern Appalachia before. Um, you know, it, it's, it's rough. Even today, but FDR is trying to, to do something for them directly here. And the TBA will last um, for two more presidents. After that. By the way, how many times was FDR elected? Do you know? Did they make the rule after? They made the rule probably exactly because of it. Afterwards, you can only serve two. TBA, yeah, he did die in office. Yeah, all around. This is millions of acres of land that gets hydroelectric power because of these, these projects. Okay, business NRA in this case does not stand for National Rifle Association. In this case, it means National Recovery Administration. And this attempt was something like what Hoover would have liked, I think. We're going to try to get businesses to cooperate and start undercutting each other, stop undercutting each other and stop putting each other out of business. Some of this would set prices for some good, so that we'll all agree that we're not going to gouge people for, you know, for, for their the goods that we're trying to charge them, the necessary things they need. It also established maximum working hours nationally and no child labor. Fair codes of competition this was FDR's favorite program. This is the one that he really thought was like his child. And he wanted this to work. He wanted to empower this thing to work because he thought if just businesses could just get together on the same page, then we would thrive. Hold that thought because two of these programs are going to be declared unconstitutional. We'll get to that tomorrow. The symbol is a blue eagle. If your business decided to be in the local NRA, National Recovery Administration, like, thing, then you were promising, you put your, you put the blue eagle in your window, your shop, and then you would promise not to put anybody else out of business in your community, right? And this was seen around the country for like two years, like it was a big thing for two years, so big that actually a professional football team named itself after this blue eagle. You tell me. Philadelphia, yeah. Philadelphia Eagles. Right? Yeah, the mascot of an NFL team that year, and what you would put in your window would look something like that. <laughs> because it is the NFL, AFL, and then the combined and like the 40. Honestly, baseball is, is much more of an impact on the economy to America's game. I don't think it really switched to the late 90s. Mm -hmm. The impact on the economy was much more, is what my guess is. I, I can't say for sure. So now we got London saving more than $3 billion in the Super Bowl in 2024. Yeah. It's probably on it. So that one, that one just there was about helping homeowners keep their home. Stock market. This wasn't accomplished during the first hundred days, but soon after the next year, we have the SEC Securities and Exchange Commission, and it's basically a watchdog to make sure that the um, stock market doesn't people don't do the bad things that had caused the stock market crash. And they put in charge of the SEC somebody who had done all those bad things on the stock market, but he sold his stocks right before the crash and therefore kept his family's money intact, his family's uh, in, uh, wealth intact. And that was Joseph P. Kennedy, father of future president John F. Kennedy. And that's not the last time I'll talk about Joseph P. Kennedy. Uh, the SEC still exists today. Okay, I'm going to stop there. We can actually put this on tomorrow's. Yeah, there, there's, there's more coming, but let, let's stop there for now. And your job tonight is to remember all of those programs, have them memorized. Alphabetically. Yep. Or chronologically. Why not?